Welcome to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on Jewish history, the Bible, Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. Find out more about David's upcoming classes, publications, and other recorded lectures by visiting davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. Hello, this is Marjorie Solomon, producer of Collected Talks of David Solomon, and welcome to the podcast for 2021. I'm delighted to be able to tell you, as I look ahead at our programming schedule, that we still have many more lectures to share with you, both taken from the archives and from those that David will be presenting live throughout the course of the year. Assuming David will be able to give his upcoming live lectures in person, it is our aim to have these lectures filmed so that you will have the option to watch as well as listen to the talks wherever you are in the world. If you would like to help cover the cost of filming these lectures, please contact me directly. For regular listeners of the podcast, I would also like to encourage you to consider becoming a patron either via the Patreon webpage or via the one-off donation option, which you will find on the website davidsolomon.online. Despite the generous sponsorship we already receive from our greatly valued patrons, we are as yet nowhere near covering the costs of hosting and producing each weekly episode. It would be fantastic in 2021 if we could move to a level where these costs are covered. But now let's turn to the lecture. We begin 2021 with a talk David gave in 2013 at the Jewish Museum of Berlin. The lecture was filmed and a recording can be found on the episode webpage or via David's YouTube channel. I'm going to talk for a little while on the topic that I submitted uh, to Sinia a few months ago. She asked for a topic that was boom, and I went for one that's boom, and they accepted it, and I really liked it. From Exile in Paradise to Redemption in Hell, the story of the Jews of Germany, past, present, and future. What that means, and I'm aware that I'm speaking not necessarily in an English-speaking country, and I know that the English of all of you is probably outstanding, but if anyone feels I'm talking too quickly, then I'm happy to slow it down. Okay, would you like that? Just slow it down a fraction? Good. When I listen to lectures in German, they have to be slowed down much more. So it's very good if I just can uh, slow it down a fraction. Those of you who have listened to the absolutely contentless talk I've given till now, will realize that what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a complete overview of the history of the Jews in Germany out of, in about, in very rapidly, very rapidly, out of which I'm hoping that together we can come to an understanding of a theory about the relationship between the Jewish world or the Am Yisrael, which is really the spiritual and ethnic collective known as the Jewish people, and another interesting spiritual and organic collective in the world known as the German people. Just as, as is discussed upstairs, just as the word, the very word Jew or Yuda is difficult for many people within European culture, and perhaps even more acutely within German culture today, the word German that very word has a certain resonance within Jewish culture itself. It's not a one-way process. When I was growing up, and you see, I'm a bit unique. I'm just going to digress personally. This is not necessarily part of the overview of German history that I'm going to deliver the whole of German history in about 10 minutes. This is just a personal footnote. Is that my family is quite unique in that they are originally from Germany. But my family have been completely outside of uh, the whole European experience for about almost 200 years. Therefore, there was, I did not come from Holocaust survivors or people who were touched by the Shoah. I came at it another way because despite having gone around the world saying, look, the lesson from history would seem to be 
that Jews should probably not be living in Germany at all, my own children have now recently taken out German passports. And I'm very pleased to be here because I was reminded of my own identity and my own exilic consciousness yesterday when I went to fly to Berlin. As a result of which, I'll talk about that in a moment. I didn't get in here till this morning, but I came from Jerusalem. And I'm in the National Library last week giving this talk some thought. And in the library there's, I don't know how many of you have been to the National Library in Israel, but the history of the Jews of Germany is a wall. It's a wall of books. It's not the only wall in the library. There are many walls, but it's a wall. So I'm standing in front of the wall, and basically I'm just pillaging books. Everything from the first mention of Germany in Jewish literature. Germany is mentioned in the Talmud, in Megillah 6b, where it's called Germamia Shel Edom. That is the first textual point at which we identify a relationship, a consciousness in the Jewish mind of this place called Germany, which is seen as some far-flung part of the Roman Empire. But in a statement which arguably is of Palestinian origin and certainly probably no later than the 3rd century, the rabbis of the Tal Talmud tell us that we pray to the divine that the forces of that people are never unleashed because they will go on to destroy the world. We are told in ancient rabbinic sources that the peoples of Germany have an understanding of the concept of Am, of the concept of peoplehood, that is the closest thing that you, the Jews, will find in the world to your own concept of nationhood. They have a destiny, they are a spiritual collective, they have a language, they have a place in the world. This is a consciousness arising out of Chazal. Chazal, we talk, use the word Chazal referring to the sages of the Midrashic and Talmudic periods who form the basic Weltanschung, if you like, of the way Jews look at the world. Not all Jews. When I say the way Jews look at the world, what do I mean by that? I mean in terms of seeing themselves as a spiritual collective with a destiny, and that destiny very much invaded by an exilic consciousness, an awareness of the incompleteness of the world and the world itself being in a state of exile and an unconscious severance from the divine plan in the world for which the Jewish people are trusted to attempt to bring the humanity itself to a type of enlightened state. That inside that consciousness, they look at the world and they see what is the role of every part within it. The concept of nationhood is very much inherent in the Jewish way of life. And we know, we know that Jews are wandering around in the Roman Empire and we know that they must have been very interesting to, for merchants and for other people to go all the way through Europe through these barbarian peoples, these pagans who, you know, eat and worship dogs or whatever they're doing, and then arrive at a town like Cologne and find, under Roman administration, a Jewish community with a synagogue and with a mikvah and with all the appurtenances of Jewish life. These, of course, are our first awarenesses chronologically and physically. I'm sure some of you have been to Cologne and have seen the excavations deep under the city. This is the first evidence we have of definitive Jewish life in Germany, but it has no continuum. It is really only where, where Roman soldiers and Roman administrators went, Jews would go. There was no established, continuous Jewish life that we are aware of. Until deeper into a few hundred years later, into the Holy Roman Empire, where not only, I mean, the rabbis of the Talmud would write. Germany did overrun Rome. It didn't just, it took it over and became its corporate entity. Set up the Holy Roman Empire. And at first, of course, for the first couple of hundred years, the Holy Roman Empire was run by some pretty chilled Christians. That is the Jewish perspective on things. 
Charlemagne and the whole strain of Carolingian kings didn't have a problem with Jews. They invited Jews. They played with Jews. They had a nice time. We talk about that period in history, which is just over a thousand years ago. The big thing going on in the Jewish world at the time was what we now call the Golden Age of Spain. Spain was the center of the Jewish world pretty much, and that was run by some chilled Muslims called the Moors and the Cordoveran Caliphate that was arising and inviting Jews to participate in building this fantastic civilization. This is the first true wave of what we, has become known in Jewish history as Yehudei Ashkenaz, the Jews of Ashkenaz, the Jews of Western Europe, predominantly Germany, although in those days also France. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide up the whole of German Jewish history from around about a thousand years ago into five major epochs because we have five what seems to be emerging from the study of the history of German Jews for the purposes of understanding where we're going now, is the emergence of five cycles, if you like. If I become too confused, if, I get, if anyone's more confused than me, let me know. So the picture I've described now, if we go back, say, to the 11th century, the 11th century, the 10 hundreds, that's going to be our starting point. Oh, green. That was meant to be blue. This is the year 1000, approx. And life is more or less idyllic. This is the picture we're getting. This is the pic there are a few spots of issues here and there, but it's mostly very nice. The Jews are keeping a quiet profile. They are moving in to German lands from the north of France, to which they're very connected and from west and southwest, and they're setting up small communities, and they're dealing as small-time merchants. The great theological Christian antagonism to Judaism has not yet taken off, and the 11th century is often seen as a quasi-golden age. You have to know what it's like for me to stand here looking at you, by the way. Some of you are going, and some of you are going... And it's difficult to know exactly where I'm, uh, where I'm going wrong. But if anyone feels that I'm completely off track, they should let me know. And we'll pick another topic. <laughs> this century here, the 1000s to 1095, despite, as I said, maybe just one or two instances of antagonistic relationship between the Jewish communities of the German-speaking peoples, is calm and quiet and somewhat thriving. The great big figure that comes down to us in Jewish history from, I mean, there are many figures that come down to us. The, the big one that comes down to us from early in the 11th century who really sets the tone, the traditionalist tone of what is going to become Yehudei Ashkenaz, German Jewry, is, of course, Rabbeinu Gershom. Rabbeinu means, it's like, you know, the term rabbi is like, okay, a rabbi, but Rabbeinu is like a rabbi on crack. It's like <laughs> super massive rabbi. Rabbeinu Gershom. And Rabbeinu Gershom comes and he really sets the tone of what is going to be Ashkenazic German Jewry. Here we are living in Christian countries. We are going to keep a low profile. This is what we're going to do. And we are going to enact certain things within Jewish life that are going to be binding. Hear that word, binding, because binding is going to become a very important word in German Jewish history. Binding on the communities living in these countries. And famously, famously, you all know, Rabbeinu Gershom's decrees. One, no Jewish man can be married to more than one woman at a time. That's how it's going to be for European Jews, unfortunately. <laughs> Jews may not, under any circumstances, open letters addressed to someone else 
regardless of who that letter is addressed to. As an actual Jewish law, as a result of which Jews were often trusted to carry letters right throughout the Middle Ages. And importantly, Rabbeinu Gershom set about the tone of how it was going to work in our relations with our Christian neighbours, and particularly our Christian princes and kings and masters, and the priests. Because already Rabbeinu Gershom and others were beginning to perceive the tensions that were existing fractionally in these two communities. Jews lived as communities within communities, and they were not seen as equal with other people, but they were given powers to run their own affairs. And so throughout that century, everything's very calm. And then, it all is shattered, completely and utterly shattered. We have seen that cycle before, but not before then, I mean after then. A period of about a century of calm, idyllic, almost gradual integration, only to be suddenly, utterly shattered by a traumatic events of immense proportions. Because in 1095, with the announcement of the First Crusade, and in 1096, Godfrey of Bouillon heading off to Palestine to take back the Holy Land for Western Christianity, all of the communities along the Rhineland suffered, most were massacred and wiped out in a phenomenal event that became known as Gzerot Tatnav, but more particular, which means really the year, in other words, the decrees, the heavenly decrees of 1096, but within, popularly within Jewish culture, known as the Akedah. The Akedah is a word that literally means binding, but of course it refers to the binding of Isaac. The rabbis tell us that the story from the Bible when Abraham takes his son to sacrifice him based on God's command, Isaac himself was completely aware of what was going on and submitted himself to that potential martyrdom. A consciousness of the instability of Jewish life in Germany became utterly ingrained in the psyche of Jewish communities on the level of literature, on the level of theology, an entire spiritual and cultural outlook that attempted to flower and be strong, but on a very, very thin ice that at any day that tranquility and stability could be destroyed and that a moment's notice a Jew needed to be prepared to have himself martyred for the sanctification of the divine name. Let's not mince about words, we all know what that means. What that means, and I'm going to talk very openly, and if anyone's offended, I apologise in advance. I don't think so. I mean, what I'm talking now is fairly understood. But martyrdom means that you die rather than become a Christian. That is what it means, in effect. It also means that you die in the face of tremendous pressure for the sake of the community, for the sake of the welfare of your fellow Jewish citizens, and even in some cases for the sake of the welfare of the wider community in general. The Jews in Germany have always, as an ideal, striven to be accepted as an integral part of German society. People talk about the Germans and the Jews, but really, really, They're inseparable. The Jews did not arrive in Germany yesterday. But if that was, and 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 make no mistake, this Akedah, these events of the 1090s, were perceived for generations after, in relative terms, as nothing less than a Shoah. We talk about the Shoah now because nothing has ever been as enormous as that. But within the context of its own historical framework, the Akedah was the biggest 
anti-Semitic genocidal project that had taken place effectively since the exile. And by now, the exile is almost a thousand years long. And just a note on exile, because many, many people who look at the concept of what it is to be Jewish in the world, and they walk around the exhibition upstairs, and they, as I did, and they go, oh, that's cool, that's interesting. They sometimes, sometimes overlook the fact that spiritually and within the engine of the sources of the Jewish people that are continually attempting to rejuvenate their relationship with the world, exilic consciousness and awareness of this incompleteness of the world, of this awareness of am I a Jewish German or a German Jew? Am I a Jewish Australian or an Australian Jew? Am I an Israeli or am I a Jew? These questions are the consequence of an exilic outlook. It means that I am somewhere where I am not complete. I am dancing between two identities. I am having to ameliorate and integrate my role towards the external world and my inner domestic life. And that has been going on for quite some time in the Jewish world. But if people thought that the quiet and the calm of the 11th century was shattered suddenly by a holocaust... And if they thought that they were going to come back and re as they did, as they did, to come back and rebuild the Jewish communities of Germany, and that the non-Jewish uh, administrators, be they kings, princes, overlords, were going to go, and the general population were going to go, oh, we're so sorry. That was really, really terrible, that Akedah business, that first crusade. 200 communities wiped out, tens of thousands of Jews massacred. Horror. We're really sorry, but we don't know how that happened. That's really bad. But it's okay. Come back and we'll rebuild and we'll try again. That didn't happen. For the next 400 years. It's almost like, it's almost like when you read the prophecies contained in the Torah about what the exile will be like. That means in the evening you'll go, oh my gosh, if only it were morning. In the morning you'd go, oh, oh, if only it were evening. It's going to be so horrible that just when you think it couldn't get any more horrible, it gets horrible at a level that you didn't ever know what horrible meant. That's the next 400 years after this. Continuous, continuous massacres, experiences, Expulsions, random, heavy, heavy, heavy taxation. And yet, the Jews constantly came back and constantly attempted to re-establish their presence in German culture and in German society. Not simply because they had nowhere else to go, but because I would argue, and we're going to look at this at the end briefly, of the inherent symbiotic fascination that the Jewish people and the German... It's a, it's, it's a fascination of repulsion to some extent. Let's be open about this. But it is a fascination and an effervescence that emerges from that engagement. While this 400 years is going on, I, I would say up until round about the year 1600, before we really notice any substantive changes in that, and those of you who were thinking, oh, come on, the 16th century wasn't so bad. I mean, hello, you know, and then the Reformation and then things are starting to get a little bit more open. No. I mean, Charles V is still burning Jews publicly. The banishment, the expulsions go on for 400 years. The standout figure, the standout figures from that entire period are those Jews who are engaged in the work of Torah. Those Jews who are engaged in constantly attempting to rejuvenate the spiritual wellspring of the Jewish people. The Jewish people have many, many things. They even have a cuisine, according to some. <coughs> by the way, by the way, it's a, been a, a, a not-so-secret joke for a long time that... Um, not even a joke, uh, that, you know, the, those of you who are familiar with the uh, 
famous Talmudic statement about how um, you know, 10 measures of beauty came into the world and Jerusalem took nine of them and then 10 measures of this and 10 measures of that. So there's a famous thing that, that 10 measures of Jewish cuisine came into the world, decent Jewish cuisine, and the Sephardic world took nine of them. <laughs> Those of us who grew up on gefilte fish and kugel and all these things. Um, the standout figure, for example, of that period is someone like Asher bin Yechiel, the Rosh. I mean, that first 200-year period of this, which would take us up to round about 1300, so 200 years, which is pretty much contemporary with the whole run of the Crusades. So the Crusades is generally pretty much considered over by 1290, And then it just gets worse. Towards the end of the 1200s, Asher bin Yechiel, the greatest rabbi in Europe, the greatest rabbi in Europe, a halachic uh, expert whose decisions were binding on all of Europe and whose influence is still felt till today in world Jewry, after seeing his own teacher, Mayor of Rottenburg, who was the great doyen of the school of the Tosafists that had come from northern France and through Germany and had developed over this entire 200-year period this tremendously original and creative pattern of Jewish life and leadership and commentary and analysis and text, saw his own teacher incarcerated by the empire by the emperor purely in order to extract ransom from Jewish communities, said, that's it, I've had enough. And with his son, Yaakov, who went on to become the famous author of the tour, decided to leave Germany and go and live in Spain. Spain itself by that time was already Christian. So was the anguish and frustration at the constant cycle of destruction and yet the Jews kept coming back every time a door opened they would run back into Worms and into Frankfurt and into Spain and into all of these places where they had just 10-15 years earlier been massacred and expelled in that order and then of course from the frying pan into the fire into the blazing heat for in a 50 year period from 1298 to the plague somewhere no upwards of 400 separate communities massacred and genocided over that period primarily of course in the famous Rheinfleisch massacres at the end of the 1290s you see people say oh and then you know 50 years later in the plague, hundreds of Jewish communities devastated by mobs who had no other way to take out their frustration. You see, people say, oh, well, that's not specifically Germany. People might say, oh, that's the pattern in European culture generally in the Middle Ages. But it's not really. I mean, England expelled its Jews in 1290. They came in under Edward the Conqueror, uh, William the Conqueror, expelled by Edward in 1290. They come back in the 17th century under Cromwell, and then it's all very, very nice. <laughs> but the Jews of Germany underwent this repeated constant cycle. And yet, out of the depths of this despair, they were constantly renewing spiritual legacy that has influence not only over us, but over the whole world. We'll get to that in a moment. So this, that's awful. And then we start another 200-year cycle of awfulness. Even at the end of the 1400s, you know that the massive book burnings, the threat to, ex to, to ban all Jewish books, massacres, expulsions, and around about 1500, even, in other words, at the beginning of the 16th century, Jewish communities are still being expelled randomly again and again and again. <laughs> The standout figure of the 16th century is, of course, someone seen as the archetypal Jew of the late medieval ages who stands up for the community is, of course, someone like Yossel of Rosheim, 
who in his relations with Charles V is defending Jewish communities. Jewish communities of Germany were also fascinating because they were developing their own models of communal leadership that ultimately became adapted all around in Jewish communities all around the world. The symbiotic relationship between the Jews of Germany and the general German population was nothing short of astounding. So as they were victimizing and perpetrating each other, they were mutually going forth on this journey together. Good. The reason I mentioned Yossel is because, of course, what happens at the beginning of the 1500s, Vayakom Melech Chadash, says the Torah, there arose a new king, and in the middle of, in the early part of the 16th century, the first half of the 16th century, there's really only one story going on in Germany, and that, of course, is the story of the Reformation. And when Luther stands up and others, the Jews are probably thinking, now is our moment. Things are going to change. And of course, they didn't. In fact, Jews were blamed for the Reformation. A very strange accusation. The Jews themselves had their own Reformation much, much later. Once again, which emerged out of Germany. But here, I'm going to move to this. So we have, we have this is our, you know what? You know what? Just, just so I stay clear and you can go away from the talk saying, well, he at least did this. We have, uh, that's our first period. And then our second period is going to go from 1100 to 1300 and then 1300 to basically 1600. This is what we call, you know, the high Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages. It seems sometimes that It's all the same thing over and over, but in fact, each cycle has its own unique aspect. The Reformation did not bring the promised relief for the Jews. In the end, the Jews were caught effectively in the middle. Bear in mind, and I know we all learnt this at school, so I'm not wanting to go over it. I'm pitching this talk at the lowest common denominator, which is myself, but I'm pitching it so that someone would be able to follow what I'm saying without jumping to too many complex ideas. But you are aware, obviously, that in the background of all of this is the ongoing economic onslaught against Jewish communities. On the one hand, the constant and unending process of taxation where if you look at the figures of what Jews had to produce in terms of taxation and what the percentage of their contribution was over this period, you cannot understand how small Jewish communities could have tolerated these burdens and survived. And the answer is that in many cases they didn't. But it wasn't just in taxation. It was also in the fact that the economic sphere of Jews became utterly theologically determined, meaning that the Jews were restricted to only one profession, and that was the profession of money lending in many, 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 many places. Not in isolated events, so we can say, well, it was, it was the rule generally that in most places in Germany throughout the Middle Ages, Jews had only one thing they were allowed to do, and that was to lend money to non-Jews at 173 and a third percent. Those percentages were worked out throughout the Middle Ages and for some bizarre reason arrived at that number as considered high enough that the Jews could make enough money that they could pay the taxation required upon them by the king but at the same time not overly exploit the population to which they were lending. This, the, in other words, the money lending rate of Jews was almost, for many, many places over long periods of time, the key determining economic factor in society as a whole. That's quite astonishing. And Jews were seen, for the most part, as being stateless, but owned by the king because they were part of his economic engine 
And just like today, governments would apply monetary policy or fiscal policy, so kings had at their disposal throughout the Middle Ages, Jew policy. And if they felt that the (laughs) influence of Jewish economics was too much, then it was very simple, you can just expel them the way you might withdraw a policy. It was as ruthless as that. But throughout the next phase, which is, let's say, 1600 to 1800, by the way, those of you who are familiar with German Jewish history will know that this overview is absurd. It, uh, I'm simply describing the epochs that appear to emerge from a very, very generalized look through a number of different literary and academic perspectives. This is what the picture that seems to be emerging, that we have a golden phase, then we have a yuck phase, then and yuck is not a word that I would normally, yuck means awful. Then we have what we might call a phase of, Transition. Some historians have referred to it as a as a, as, a, as as a crisis of transition. Uh, what happened? What happened? Just in case anyone didn't hear about this, but somewhere around about 1600 uh, and throughout the 17th, much of the 17th century, European culture underwent what's called the Enlightenment. I know. That's not a simple concept. That's not a simple concept. And what was happening in the world for which the Reformation is also partly responsible, or or at least partly a manifestation of, was a breakdown, obviously, and we all know this once again from school. I'm not telling you anything new. was a breakdown of established orders and the rise not only of new power structures, but also of new economic structures. Jewish life in Germany happens because of economic opportunity. The Jews, this is one perspective, that the Jews have no intrinsic reason to be in Germany. No intrinsic reason. There is nothing innately holy about the German soil. There is for Germans. I believe so. And just as the land of Israel, the soil of the land of Israel is holy for Jews. But Jews had no innate reason to be in Germany. And this is possibly one of the most contentious things I'm going to say this evening because it's reflected in our own age other than economic. It doesn't mean that Jews are economically driven in the final sense of it. Jews just want to be left alone and have a peaceful existence. But if we transport that back to the Middle Ages, it's where can a Jew make a living for his family? Where can Jewish communities establish themselves to have a thriving and ongoing actual existence? We don't access the land. A Jew in the Middle Ages in Germany doesn't have a little square meter he can plant tomatoes. But this picture is changing. It's breaking down in this period because of the rise of capitalism. And because the rise and the changes that that brings about in structures and Jews themselves are starting to emerge a little bit from the closet and we start to see the rise of a German middle class. This is where it happens. When you read the diaries of Gluckel of Hamlin and you look at a figure like, does it, people know who I'm talking about when I talk about that. If you're not sure, there's a whole thing in the museum on her, I believe. She's classic representation of that. If you look in the 18th century, and it's astonishing because just within a short, we say a short 200 years, in the 18th century you have a figure like Mendelssohn. And although Mendelssohn is only living in Berlin, because he has a tolerance patent from the king, nevertheless, he's seen as the archetypal Jew. Not typical, but archetypal. Mendelssohn is a figure who literally, 
walked from the shtetl in the east to set himself up in Berlin and become the greatest philosopher of his day. How does a Jew do that? Other Jews are looking at this going, that's nice, how does he make a living? Mendelssohn is uh, an astonishing figure. And once again, Mendelssohn comes under tremendous pressure from the world and society around him. You, Mendelssohn, you're a philosopher. You play chess with Lessing. You hang out in salons. You talk the talk. You know Kant. I mean, great. But you are still living your life according to the Old Testament. How does that work? How can you be, on the one hand, part of this big picture of the rise of the age of reason and enlightenment, but on the other hand, you are putting on tefillin and you're keeping the Sabbath and you're keeping kosher and you're adhering to the spiritual tradition of your ancestors. How does that work? Mendelssohn was responsible for developing the whole rise of this integrative theology an integrated theology which is essentially summed up as Yehudi, be a Jew at home, or Ben Adam Betzetra. But when you walk outside your house, be a human being. Be a human being. This is a message that resonates with Jews. And something I'm just going to touch upon for a second. Because a lot of people think that Jews walk around thinking all day long, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. Everywhere I go, I go and buy a Coke from the tequila, I'm a Jew, I go this, I'm a Jew. Some Jews do, trust me, but not most. Most Jews walk around looking at themselves and other people as human beings. Mendelssohn's idea that it is possible to integrate these two aspects of a person give rise not only to his own personal philosophy but a part of the whole burgeoning movement of the Haskalah of the specifically Jewish enlightenment. This attempt to bring the treasures of the spiritual legacy of the Jewish people to world culture. Mendelssohn of course translated the Bible into German as part of that project. And tried also, and this is important for later considerations, tried also to raise the profile or the meaning of Jewish identity to the realm of the philosophical. Such that Jews remain Jews in the world in order to remind the world and to maintain within the world certain fundamental concepts that reflect the relationship between the world and its creator, such as freedom. The Jews gave the world the concept of a weekend. And the, so long as there are Jews in the world, there will always be the concept of rest in the world. There will always be the concept of freedom. These are big ideas. And then, of course, you know, another another archetypal Jew emerging from uh, from the ghetto, you know, Rothschild, who goes on to create the largest private family fortune in the world. And he's the banker of kings, and he wines and dines with royalty. And Jews are sitting around going, How does that happen? Where did that come from? Well, obviously, it came from the breakdown of all of the structures that had gone along with the medieval world, of which the Reformation and the Enlightenment are part. This relationship is utterly symbiotic and mutual. And then, of course, boom, 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 along comes Napoleon. And then we enter probably the... I'm I'm calling this transition. Many people would say, well, that's really part of what's going to come. But I think that this 200-year period is its own... I mean, the 18th century is mind-blowing in Jewish thought. We don't have time to go into the great geniuses and rabbis and spiritual thinkers that emerged, even specifically from Germany, throughout this period. But the Jewish community themselves underwent upheavals. 
There were new political models developed, parliaments even, and rabbis fought, as rabbis do, for the spiritual direction of the Jewish world. And that's all broken apart because along comes Napoleon. And we famously know that Napoleon says, not you're not a Jew anymore, but I don't care. I don't care. You're French, you're this, you're that. If you want to be a Jew in your own private time, no problem for me, so long as you understand that's not necessarily your primary identity, but I don't have a problem with it. Otherwise, we have this new thing in the world called a secular identity. That is, I'm part of the nation state. And we all know that the nation state is the bastard child of romanticism. That's quite clever. And of course, that means that the 19th century sees a complete breakdown of previous structures. I mean, obviously, it wasn't a straightforward curve. Those of you who are familiar with 19th century history, we don't know it went back and forth a bit. But on the whole, it moves towards breaking down all of those former structures and perhaps an even honest attempt on all sides of the fence to try and get along, to let's pretend we're all just normal people going about our business. That, of course, was not always the case. Jews who wanted to reach the highest levels within society would inevitably have to convert to Christianity. If you wanted, for example, you know, a permanent position in government or in academia or whatever, certainly for the first two-thirds of the 19th century, and then as we move towards the end of the 19th, emancipation becomes pretty much a full-blown concept. We've now gone back, not quite to this period, because we're no longer keeping a a low profile. We are deeply involved in European life. We're deeply involved in German life. The closer we get to our own time, the less I have to fill in the details because I know that you are all familiar with the picture that then emerges. By the time you get to the 20s and 30s in Germany, academic and the life of the intelligentsia and the professional world generally is highly overrepresented with Jews and is saturated with people who refer to themselves as Jews. And yet, through this period, we're also seeing conflicting movements such as the rise of Zionism, the rise of is there such a thing as a Jewish national consciousness, can we have a state, etc., etc. And future historians will look back and they'll say how amazing that is that that was happening in absolute parallel with what was going on politically in Germany and in Europe and in other places. And of course, by the time the Nazis come to power in Germany and suddenly, despite having a thousand years of history to look at, the Jews are suddenly surprised. And they're surprised perhaps with reason. Because the Enlightenment and and all of the promises of emancipation had held out great hope for the Jews. Remember, secular Judaism, and we've seen this again and again, and I'm a big fan of secular Judaism. I mean, I call myself a secular Jew who keeps the commandments. I mean, what do you want? But secular Judaism doesn't really, I mean, inherent in its own definition, doesn't really have a long continuum. You only have to be completely secular for three or four generations and your great-grandchildren will no longer realize that they're Jewish and their children won't even know and their children will hardly have heard of it. And then their children will be saying, oh, I think my great-great-great-great-grandfather or grandmother was Jewish. That's the nature of secular. That's the nature of secularism. That's not a judgment on it. That's a pure description because it's inherent in the word. And we have seen that in all of the places where secularism becomes inherent. Some people I'm seeing in the audience are not liking this. Whereas, whereas, there's no, and I'm saying this for a reason, there's no question that an adherence to traditionalism, right or wrong. This is not, I'm not making a discussion now on whether I think people should be Orthodox Jews or Reformed Jews or Liberal Jews or non-Jews or blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying that it seems that an adherence to tradition 
and an attempt to pass on the inner values of Jewish life according, authentically aligned with the sources of Jewish spirituality affords continuum for Jewish life. Obviously, this 19th century story of emancipation leading to a total outpouring, an outpouring of the Jewish intellect upon European culture generally makes the modern world. It makes the modern world. The whole of our existence today is inconceivable without that symbiotic relationship between Jews and Germans that happened throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. And all of the major intellectual (coughs) movements were saturated with people coming either from the German idealist tradition or the Jewish tradition or a melding of both. But all of that, of course, leads up to the Shoah. And the Shoah needs no discussion in terms of detail. Shoah is not like the Akedah. I know that I was intimating earlier that there is a parallel to be made between the way that this period perhaps mimics and reflects to some extent this period, but it's not the same, and you know it's not quite the same. It's not simply because it's about numbers, but it's about the nature of the Shoah as obviously... You see, back in the Akedah, back in the Gzerot Tatnav, the bureaucrats and leaders and to some extent even the priests of Germany themselves were outwardly against these massacres. They were just impotent to do anything and what they did was too little and too late. That is a very different thing from what happens later on where somehow, somehow, and this is not isolated obviously to the German peoples, but somehow a some sort of I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to share a Kabbalistic secret with you. And uh, it's going to bring us back to the beginning and then I'm winding up. I'm going to share a Kabbalistic secret. This is a secret that we're, we're, people are going to... I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you told people that in like you know, Germany, the Jewish Museum. So it's very important that what I'm about to say is contextualised. The inner perspective inside Jewish mystical apprehension of what happened in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s and the 1940s, apart from all of the theological discussion, there is an inner mystical perspective that as part of the general, general historical projection and continuum of Edom, which is Rome, and remember the rabbis of the Talmud had said Germany within the, Holy, the Roman Empire, there became manifest, and, and, and once again, I'm going to say this again, some people will walk out of there going, ah, and I'm going to say this again, this is not necessarily what I'm talking about, this is not necessarily what I'm saying, I deal most of my world is in Kabbalistic texts. And most of my time is spent translating the Zohar. And then I get emerged and schlepped off to Germany to give a talk. And then I have to go back to the cave. So I'm just telling you how these things are perceived in the cave. This is not necessarily my opinion, nor does anyone need to take this. But this is a perspective deep within Jewish mystical thinking. That whatever spirit was manifest within the German peoples during the Shoah was not a permanent spirit, but a transient manifestation of the concept of Amalek. Amalek is a spirit identified within Jewish historical discourse as being that physical genocidal force that always precedes a return to the land of Israel. The source for that, of course, is in the book of Exodus when Amalek itself attacks the Jewish people on their way to Israel. 
Haman in the story of Esther is a is a as a scion of the of the Amalekic dynasty. He attempts a physical genocide, and that very same spirit is not inherent with any one people in Europe. It became manifest temporarily within that field. Theologically, that's important. When I was growing up in Australia, even though my entire family had missed the whole Holocaust experience, I'm an eighth generation Australian. I stayed Jewish, it's quite remarkable. But when I was growing up, the word German and the word German, he was like, oh. And people go, oh, I can't believe it, he bought a Mercedes. Oh my like, God, oh. you know, in Australia of all places. And even I found myself saying, I can't bring myself to visit Germany in the 20th century. But I started visiting Berlin in 2001, 2002, when we were living in London, and I've been coming back at regular intervals ever since. I never thought that this would be the case, but this is like my sixth or seventh visit to Berlin over the course of the last 10 years, and I really like it. I really like Berlin. And that's given me some insight not just Berlin, but, but, but German culture generally. Don't start quizzing me on that because I wouldn't be... But as soon as I sat in the taxi, I'm starting to speak German, you know, from the airport. Like, I'm, like I'm here, I'm there. It's, there's something deep inside Jews who wander a lot to be inside a culture that has a deep understanding of the concept of nationhood. And then we get to the next period after the Shoah, which you know is sort of divided into two. It's like pre-reconciliation, post-reconciliation. After that whole delicate balance of the special relationship, Israel changes everything. That is what is different. It is impossible for us to access the consciousness of Jews who lived in the world prior to the state of Israel. Prior, I would even say, to the rise of Zionism. Even our grandparents... Our parents or our grandparents or even maybe some of us in the audience who were alive before the rise of the state of Israel still lived in a world where it was possible and was likely to happen. Balfour is nearly a hundred years ago. The idea of a Jewish state is in the consciousness of every human on the planet. It's impossible to access what it was like on the other side of that. And I'm talking now about how Jews perceive themselves in the world. Jews do not know why they are Jews, by the way. That's something that, um, it's interesting because the exhibition upstairs, like it's fantastic. And it suddenly made me realize when I was thinking about it afterwards, do I know why? And I don't know why I'm a Jew. So obviously, I ha people who join the Jewish people and their destiny in history merit to perhaps have an insight into that. But for those of us who are born Jewish, we really don't know that's just the way it is. <sighs> that delicate balance between the new state of Israel and the appalled with itself society of Germany uh, then undergoes a whole new framework with the breakdown of the structures of the Soviet Union. I have been around Germany, I have been to communities, I have seen some of what is going on. Not everything, but some. As I do missions for the Council of the Elders of Zion around the place, I get to see communities that are extremely strange. Communities with 5,000 Jews in them and not one single unit of Jewish communal infrastructure. Maybe a Chabad Shaliach and their family if they're lucky. This is a different type of growth. This is very, very different. The Jews coming who have built this, you know, this, these figures and, and every, every article I read it's got a different figure. Some say 100,000 Jews, some say 150,000 Jews, some say 200,000 Jews. It is a Astonishing that the fastest growing Jewish community in the world outside of Israel is Germany. It is astonishing when we look at the picture of again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And we can only hold out hope that this time it may be different. 
Perhaps the real effect of the Shoah is much more about effecting a tikkun, a rectification upon the psyche of German nationhood than in fact it is upon the Jewish people, or that the Jewish people themselves are still reeling with the impact of those events. And no discussion of German Jewry is possible without reference to that, but it will take on new directions. The people who have mostly built up these numbers in the last 20 to 30 years are not Jews coming with a strong spiritual and traditional background. I'm saying that outwardly. People don't like it, but there you have it. They're not of the highly informed. It is going to take time. It is not until this country once again produces Jews who are, in a sense, authentically aligned with their own sources and are making great spiritual contributions that themselves then go ahead to rejuvenate Judaism and rejuvenate the world. Remember that it was in Germany that the primary texts, the primary Kabbalistic and mystical texts were written that were read ultimately by Newton and Leibniz that went on to change the way the people think about the transformation of consciousness in the world. And whether we're talking about Marx, Einstein or Freud, once again, we look forward to that picture of effervescent symbiotic relationship between the Germans and the Jews. And the future, the future, there's a number of, number of conflicting statements emerging from here and they're just getting stuck there and it's not coming out. The Jewish people are charged, and I'm finishing on this point, and then if there are any questions, and, 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 and don't think that I'm not aware that there are massive things that I have not talked about. All right, We've just wanted to do an overview of German Jewry because I wanted people... When the, because I go around the world, and when, you know when I do the whole of Jewish history in one hour? Yeah. Did anyone see that last year? That circus? Yeah. So it's impossible for me to even begin to touch upon things. And yet when I talk about the Holocaust not being isolated, and I talk about the thousand-year history of German Jewry, and that it's astonishing why Jews keep coming back to Germany... I'm really, really grateful for Silly and the museum for offering me the opportunity to perhaps expand upon that point. And if all I've done this evening is overview, overview the basic waves and cycles of German history, then we can start to experience that existentially. What does that mean? Because the future... I'm... The... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say something now and some of you are going to look at me and you're going to go, ah, oh, you're really naive. You don't know what you're talking about. And I'd probably agree with you. Except that I don't understand. You know, I went to... I went to... Um, I went to Nuremberg. This was a few years ago. And you know in Nuremberg, it's all still there. It's all still there. And he himself said, we're not building this for now. We're sending a message far into the future. And they keep it. And then not only do they keep it, they maintain it. There's dudes there with hoses washing it down. So I climb all the way to the top and I stood where he stood. And I shouted, Am Yisrael Chai. And then I'm shown the big new, you know, the big round thing in the forest there. Structures are symbols and symbols are structures. And there is something that we as humanity have to overcome for this cycle to stop. The Jewish people are charged with bringing the oneness of the divine to the world. That's a big call. And to understand that the world will not arrive at peace until human beings see themselves first and foremost as human beings. And as sharing in that oneness and wonder of what it is to be human. And only to use the particularism of individual identity as a vessel to express the universal, not as something that subjugates the universal. 
Not something that says that God is only understood through me or through my way, but that I am born in this unique way so that I can utilize that uniqueness, A, to respect other, and B, to express the universality of God in the world. And only then can human history really begin. And it is a history that, without a doubt, the Jews of Germany will have a tremendous part to play. And that will determine, be determined by the ongoing evolution of the German peoples themselves. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the talk. For episode notes and transcripts, or to learn more about David's next classes and projects, visit davidsolomon.online. You can also find David on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.